start, I have to make the, a speaker and audience selfie um, because my German colleagues have to believe me that I was in uh, Singapore. So everybody say hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm from Germany, but actually I'm not here in Singapore only for this talk. Um, I'm on uh, holidays, on vacation here in Singapore, and... Uh, they don't spray, I'm too sure. Okay. And my wife and me did uh, a cruise ship tour to, from Dubai to Singapore, and we arrived two days ago. Say hello to uh, Katharina, my wife. <laughs> okay, so, technique works. Great. So tonight I want to talk about uh, containers versus serverless. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Who of you uh, uh, know this uh, movie? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And not that much. You should really sh uh, um, uh, look it. It's uh, w watch it. Uh, it's it's really worth one of the best western I know. Okay. Some facts about me. Um, I'm pretty long in the computer business right now. Um, as a child, I started with some uh, Commodore uh, VC20. Anybody of you know a VC20 computer? You do? Oh, yeah, cool. Um, C64, pretty much. Yeah, some, some more people. Okay. Um, the VC20 was much more smaller than, and we have uh, only had a, a, a thing called data setter. It's a, a cassette recorder for storing um, data. No, no floppy disks. Okay, um, what else? Um, yeah, now I'm working as a freelance, uh, freelance consultant in Germany and uh, every time I think I have seen it all, a new problem of course. So um, I don't call myself front-end developer, back-end developer, full-stack developer. Um, I call myself problem solver. Doesn't, doesn't matter which problem occurs, I try to solve it. Um, yeah, um, since 20 years in IT business, I'm also a uh, lead uh, of a local Java user group in Germany. It's called uh, Java user group uh, Darmstadt. Uh, Darmstadt is a town. It's nearby Frankfurt. So you don't have to know uh, Darmstadt, but per perhaps you know Frankfurt. Yeah. Um, we do also regular talks uh, every month, and I'm speaking also at uh, tech conferences all over the world. Um, I spoke also at... Uh, a conference now uh, calling Code One, formerly known as Java One, um, by Oracle in San Francisco, and uh, in Norway, in Sweden. I also attended uh, a Workstays conference. Uh, I spoke at the Workstays conference in uh, Zurich, in uh, Switzerland. Yeah, and I um, wrote a book about serverless computing. Unfortunately for you guys, it's only in German, so you have to learn German. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to? Okay, <laughs> great, great. Okay, um, yeah. So uh, perhaps I will translate it in the future, perhaps not, I don't know. And um, if you are on Twitter and like to, uh, to mention me, it's uh, Das Nico. And if you forget it, just say to me, I have to uh, turn around. That's <laughs> on, my, on my back. Okay, serverless computing. Who of you uses serverless computing? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, oh that's, that's pretty much for user group events at this time. Um, who of you know serverless computing? Some more people. Who of you doesn't know about serverless at all? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, not that much because um, I won't do a, a complete introduction to serverless. This talk. Um, is for people knowing serverless. And just one difference between um, uh, serverless and containers. And I really like serverless, and so there might be a rant on uh, containers. So don't, don't judge me because of this. Um, and don't judge me if the, because of the color of my laptop. It's not my laptop, it's uh, from Kathy's laptop. It was more light uh, and uh, smaller to, to travel with. Okay. So, um, there's fuss about the name serverless. Actually, all you have, you, of you have heard about um, this, this crude name serverless, there are also servers, okay, but it's just a name, don't worry about it. And if you still have problems with the name serverless and you have 
problems to explain it to your co-workers or to your family, just um, think about it um, going to some, um, it's not called uh, takeaway here in Singapore, it's called hawker center. Um, just go to a hawker center, uh, eat some delicious food and um, this is kitchenless. Because there is, there, actually there is a kitchen, the food is made in the kitchen, but you don't have to clean it. That's great. And that's exactly how serverless works. Of course there are servers, but you ha don't have to care about all this servers. Um, but not, that's not the, the, the point I came uh, up for this talk. Um, there was another tweet uh, of Tim Wagner, he's a product manager, I think so, uh, at uh, HWS for all the serverless stuff. And he retweeted a uh, tweet from Ben Kehoe. He's, uh, ben Kehoe is an engineer at iRobot. Uh, the company is doing the, the um, robots, uh, what it's called, um, when you know the German word Staubsauger. Yeah. Um, and um, he tweeted, if you have a container that is active and it's not handling data, this is a server. So just powering up a container and uh, executing some code, a function, a method, or whatever, once a day or twice a day or so sometimes, um, that's not serverless. That's a running server. And um, Tim Wagner said, hey, that's exactly, that's beautiful what it is. This was at uh, October 27, uh, 17, end of October, approximately a year ago, um, at um, end of the day. Uh, it was German time and um, half past 11 p.m. German time, it's uh, in the afternoon of San Francisco time. So it began. Um, when I, I, I went to bed at, uh, at 12 o'clock and when I wake up uh, at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, 1st November, Adrian Cockroft joined the conversation. He's um, Senior Vice President Cloud Strategy at HWS. Nice title, Senior Vice President Cloud Strategy. Um, formerly as, uh, at um, Netflix. And he's, if you stop paying when there's no traffic, that's serverless. It's one of the key features of serverless. You only pay for um, the time you use the infrastructure. <coughs> so we move on at the day. In the evening of 1st November, Adrian Cockcroft again responds to Ben McGuire. What if it's on premise? What if I have a serverless environment on premise? Serverless on premise? OK, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's on premise, it's not serverless. You have uh, chargeback economics, and that doesn't work with small companies. Only if you have a really, really large company, um, then all um, the chargebacks will work for a real serverless uh, environment. And um, then Ben McGuire also asked, if I run Lambda styles on premise, they're not serverless, but they're not containers or VMs or servers. Yay, that's great. And Adrian created uh, an expression called fast on containers. And I really like this expression, fast on containers. Um, you see it's uh, 2nd November, uh, 6.50 in the morning. Um, long conversation and it uh, was pretty fun to read all this uh, stuff. And again, someone is paying for idle time. We have a container infrastructure. You have to pay for idle time, even if there's no executed code, even there, if there's no code written by you is what's executed. Of course, there's code executed from the, from the container runtime, uh, container management system, but there's no code ex uh, executed was written by you, but you have to pay for the uptime of the whole cluster. And uh, I really like this uh, fast on containers expression, and they're pretty much fast on containers frameworks. They call themselves serverless, I call them um, fast on containers frameworks. They're pretty good, all these um, frameworks. I don't say um, don't use these frameworks. It's pretty good. If you have the, the, the need to use um, these, uh, these frameworks, if you have the, the need to um, have more control over the environment uh, you want to, uh, want to use, then such a uh, framework might be a good choice. Because all of these frameworks um, what do they do? You're writing the code and um, 
at compile time, a container is built, and you have to care about this container um, for execution. Okay, perhaps uh, OpenWhisk is uh, working a bit uh, more like serverless, but you have to provide uh, a, a real um, big uh, infrastructure to run all this uh, thing. And um, again, serverless is not fast on containers. Serverless is much, much more than just having a framework running a function um, on my container infrastructure. We will see that later on in the talk. For example, I picked um, one infrastructure from FN Project by Oracle um, to show you how the infrastructure is built up or what infrastructure you have to maintain for um, running a serverless environment. First, you have a load balancer for all the requests coming in and balancing for to all the servers to the machines actually executing your code. So you need plenty man, uh, much of them. Depends on uh, how your um, system works. And for all the, the management of this, you need a database for some metadata. Um, you need a messaging system if you want to have uh, asynchronous uh, execution of your code. You need some object store files, logs files, whatever. And of course, you need a, a container registry for your containers. So it's pretty much of infrastructure to be serverless or infrastructureless. And who wants to manage infrastructure of you? No one. Thanks you. Um, OpenWhisk is um, pretty, uh, uh, pretty seamlessly in the, in the same direction. You always have um, this, this kind of, of stuff. You have a registry, object store, messaging um, components, and database. You have all to maintain this thing. And um, beginning of this year, there was uh, Simon Wardley, so this man on the right side, Simon Wardley from uh, United Kingdom, um, a researcher. Uh, he did a keynote at a German conference and he talked about serverless and uh, building your own serverless. And he compared building your own serverless environment with building a toaster on your own. If you want to toast a bread, what do you do? You go buying a toaster, buy a bread, put the bread in the toaster, wait two minutes and eat the toasted bread. What don't you do? you don't buy all the single parts for a toaster. Of course, you can buy all the single parts for a toaster and assemble all the parts um, together by yourself. But are you experts in building toasters? No, you're experts in, in eating bread or eating rice or eating noodles or whatever in Singapore. So um, in the end of the day, you have a self-made toaster which will explode. And uh, then you have spent too much money for having nothing. That's not what you want. So if you want to go serverless, you shouldn't build it on your own. You should use uh, a ready packaged, uh, or ready run, ready managed um, environment. And um, if you use an own environment, it feels like packaging one suitcase in another. At the end of the day, you have a real big suitcase, but a really small content. Yeah, you have uh, Function, JVM, Docker, Kubernetes, DCOS, Mesos, virtual machines, hypervisor, bare metal. That's pretty much. And you have, you have to maintain it. You have to manage it. You have to patch it. And um, at this, pretty the same time, I did this picture. Uh, I saw a tweet of Sam Newman um, with pretty the same um, expression. So all this stuff needs patching. If hardware, operating system, hypervisor, VM OS, Docker, container OS, and finally your app or your function, your code. All this needs patching. Who of you likes patching infrastructure? No one. Me neither. So. Um, and does it feel secure and stable with all this stuff? Some Kubernetes, some DCOS, some Mesos. I know guys uh, from a company in Germany 
who started to think about um, Mesos, DCOS, and Kubernetes, or or Kubernetes, or whatever in which combination ever, three years ago. And today, they're not yet running anything of it because they're saying it's too complicated. Complicated. It's too much stuff to learn. The learning curve is too, too, too steep, high, and um, we don't have time to learn all this stuff. We are developers. We are not um, system administrators. So if you use containers, and containers are still a great choice. I also love containers. I use containers in some projects at some customers of mine, where serverless is not a choice. But containers are. But if you have used containers, you have a great power, but you have uh, also um, high responsibility of the running system. Because not only if it, that because it's possible to run an Oracle database in a container, it's a good idea to run an Oracle database in a container, or a Web3 application server, or whatever. You can do that, but all the guys I know who packaged an uh, Oracle database or a WebLogic container into a Docker container, they say it was horrible to do this. It's not a good idea. So also, um, if you run a container with a uh, full packaged uh, operating system, you have many, um, many um, attack uh, possibilities from the outside to this container. It's not secure. Perhaps there are containers with open debug ports because just, I just want to debug the production system. You're laughing. I know guys who are running production systems with open debug ports. Never ever do this. Production systems must not be uh, debugged. No, 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 no. Never, never ever. So, um, if you have containers but want to go server serverless, and serverless isn't the right name, perhaps you should um, call it containerless. That's what Lynn Lanchett herself uh, created, the word. Lynn Lanchett is one of the serverless superheroes um, created by Cloud Guru. And she said, um, containers are the new VMs, considered legacy. So don't use it, only if there's no other way. And if you really have to use containers, just use containers in a serverless way. How to do this? Because if you use serverless, you just write your code, throw it into um, the serverless environment, and um, say, um, execute this code depending on uh, event A, B, and C, and um, just uh, give the function some memory, and um, the environment will, will do the rest, or the provider will do the rest. And also, this is possible for containers. It's um, at, at AWS, it's uh, called Fargate. Also, Azure has um, the possibility to put uh, containers into the cloud and just uh, have to execute it um, depending on, on events. So you just have to build your container, choose an orchestrator, because AWS has two orchestrators for um, containers, ECS, the Elastic Container System, the HWS own um, container system and uh, EKS, the Kubernetes system. And you define your application and define your application means um, define the events which are responsible to execute the container, how long the container should run, how much um, memory the container will uh, get and um, how the, the container um, infra infrastructure should scale and that's all. And then you can launch all the containers and run it, and Fargate will do the rest for you. Will the container uh, will, will pull up, uh, um, push up all the, the infrastructure for running a complete cluster environment. And you just have to build your container and say um, how the containers should uh, be executed. So now I'm talking pretty much about HWS stuff. Fargate or Lambda for uh, serverless. And um, especially in Germany, there are people saying, hey, vendor login, it's bad, vendor login, it's bad. Also in Singapore, vendor login, it's bad. Yes? 
Depends. In Germany, vendor login is bad. So better we buy your Oracle database and have no vendor login. So just a moment. <laughs> yeah, don't know. Um, so um, I, I call it, uh, if, if you buy an Oracle database or IBM database, I call it a um, golf course decision. It's um, not based on technical requirements, it's just based on sales and uh, some um, yeah, relations between managers. So what is, how is this window login compared with uh, all this cloud stuff? And um, again, Adrian Cockcroft, um, comes into in the scene, he said at the times at um, uh, Netflix, his Netflix times, um, he said, we did a comparison, we did a calculation. If we would move our complete infrastructure running on HWS to two other clouds, whatever they will be, Azure, Google, whatever, it's still um, not that expensive as doing on our own. So providing the whole infrastructure on our own at the same level the cloud providers do is too expensive for I will say 98% of the companies. So vendor login is not that bad and you can build your functions, your serverless functions in a way that they are portable between the cloud providers. So just implement your, um, your business logic um, in, in a regular way and then put on, on top uh, a thin layer for the, the um, cloud agnostic, um, uh, cl uh, cloud specific um, APIs. So if you want to avoid login and have total control, you don't move fast. You won't be able to, uh, um, to react in a fast way to uh, changes on, on the market. And I think that's um, one requirement we have today. We have to be fast. If there are change requirements at the market, if our competitors are com coming up with no new ideas, um, of course they won't because we are the, the, the market leaders. <laughs> um, we have to be fast. We don't have uh, time to, to care about infrastructure, to care about um, total control. We just have to release um, features. Anybody of you know um, uh, the book, um, what is it called? Phoenix Project. Yes? Phoenix Project is, uh, I really uh, recommend this book. It's a book about DevOps, about um, yeah, agility in, in, in a, in, on a high level and uh, coping with uh, internal requirements and external requirements. Really, really good book. Um, it's, it's, um, it's written as a novel, but has um, really much uh, um, information in it. The Phoenix Project. Go out and read it. So, um, also in Germany, we want to be cloud native. Also in Singapore, everybody wants to be cloud native and nobody w knows what cloud native actually means. So um, this is the um, landscape from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And um, this picture is approximately three months old. So it's um, very old. And uh, I think today there are much more, uh, yeah, I call it tools. So the Cloud Native Compute Foundation and foundation sounds very good. And uh, they just want to uh, want our best and don't want money. No. They want to earn money also. And um, yeah, there are many tools. And if you use these tools, you are cloud native. That's what the Cloud Native Computer Foundation says. Um, no, not really. And there's also, there's also a serverless cloud native bubble. We can enlarge it. So there are also many, many platforms and tools and frameworks and whatever, um, still not all the tools on it. Um, no, not because you're just using some tool, you're automatically cloud native. 
And uh, with Kubernetes, it's, it seems to be uh, the worst thing uh, I ever heard. Uh, Kubernetes, for me, it's just like um, uh, the J2EE application server. Kubernetes itself, it's a great framework, great tool. But I'm a developer. I don't want to care about Kubernetes. And uh, luckily, there are more and more um, people coming up with this, uh, this thing. Kubernetes is not for developers and other things the hype never told you. Um, that's a tweet of, of a talk at the Velocity Conf uh, Conference in USA um, two, uh, two months ago. And yeah, Kubernetes is very complex. And Kubernetes will be the cloud operating system. I strongly believe this. But again, I don't want to care about Kubernetes or something else. I just want to use a ready managed uh, environment. And uh, who of you heard about um, the public Kubernetes um, cloud from Tesla? No one? Um, Tesla thought uh, it's a good idea to start playing around with uh, Kubernetes. It was the beginning of uh, this year, I think mm, around February or March, I don't know exactly. And uh, so the engineers installed a Kubernetes cluster on HWS and they didn't secure it. So it was public. <laughs> um, they thought, oh, we don't have to secure it. Why? It's just a standalone uh, cluster, no connection to our internal systems, so no problem. No problem in, in, in uh, case of data, yes. But there's computing power. It was accessible, accessible um, publicly. And some uh, guys detected, hey, there's a cool cluster, have uh, really much power, let's use it for mining uh, bitcoins. <laughs> so Tesla um, paid money for uh, other people mining bitcoins. And I think the Tesla guys are not that stupid. But they didn't secure the, the, the Kubernetes cluster that good. Um, so think about it if you install a Kubernetes cluster. But back to cloud native. What it actually means. Um, this took me quite a long time to, to find it on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation website. It's uh, at the, the um, Frequency Ask Question page, but this is also just uh, linked at the, the bottom, very, very small, and uh, it's very hidden. It actually means it's containerized. Every code, every application, function, whatever I execute, running in a container. That's okay for serverless, because serverless, I um, upload my, my, my code and um, the cloud provider will package it into a container and execute con the container at runtime. So I don't have to uh, care, but it's ex executed in a container. So it's containerized, check. Dynamically orchestrated, for sure, because I have no influence how the, um, of not that much influence, how the, um, the, the code, the function should be executed. In HWS Lambda, I just can say um, at max um, 1,000 or 2,000 instances of my uh, function can be executed and um, one uh, function can have um, memory in terms of um, 128 megabyte and up to I think it's now three megabyte or six megabyte, don't know exactly what's the latest news. Um, but it's automatically orchestrated. For every event um, occurs, a function is executed. And if there are plenty much um, simultaneous events, for all these events are containers started. Um, also, if there's a denial of service attack, it's not your problem. It's handled by the infrastructure, by the cloud, and it's handled by your credit card. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but at the, the infrastructure side, you have no problem. Um, last point, service-oriented, microservice-oriented. Uh, of course, serverless functions should, by design, be much 
uh, a very small, just a pure function, like the definition of a pure function. Um, no side effects, and with the same um, input parameters, you have also the same output parameters. Um, and a microservice mostly is much bigger than just a function. So if a, micro, if a lambda function is, or a serverless function is smaller than a microservice, it's also um, is microservice oriented. So all these three um, uh, bullet points are um, exactly the, the case for serverless. So you don't have to use Kubernetes to be cloud native. And there's also a serverless working group in the Cloud Native Con uh, Compute Foundation, which released um, uh, cloud events in a, a first version. And cloud events is a project for um, aligning the, the um, structure of the events, uh, initiating the, the functions. So at this time, all the cloud providers have a different structure um, for their events, which uh, will invoke the functions. And the project uh, Cloud Events tries to, uh, to align this. Until now, so this was the case, um, version 0.1, I think, uh, in, in, in early summer. And um, today, no one of the cloud providers is really um, supporting this. Um, this project. Why? Because the cloud providers don't want you to have an aligned um, event structure and uh, moving from one cloud provider to another. They want to bind you um, at their cloud, naturally. And uh, if you're still uh, a fan of cloud native, um, you should um, read this um, cloud native bingo, bullshit bingo style. I read it loud because um, if you hear it, it's much more confusing than uh, just reading it. Cloud native architectures take full advantage of on-demand delivery, global de uh, deployment, elasticity, and higher level services. They enable huge improvements in developer productivity, business utility, scalability, availability, utilization, and cost savings. Sounds good. <laughs> cost savings. Most important point, cost savings. Um, if Customers ask me, Nico, what do, um, uh, what do we save if we move our infrastructure to the cloud? I respond to them, nothing. In the first months or first one or two years, you will spend more money um, than now. Because at this time, you have a running infrastructure. You can use it. And moving this infrastructure to the cloud um, costs time, costs effort, costs manpower to build up the, the infrastructure again. This will um, level out in a few years. And just to move uh, the cloud, whatever, just um, uh, VMs or, or serverless uh, infrastructure, um, won't uh, save you money. You will get more possibilities. You will get um, much more flexible and, and perhaps much more secure for, for changes, market changes, and, and other things. But you won't save money, actually just lift and shift your infrastructure to the cloud. So if your boss um, says, let's go to the cloud to save money, say, you won't save money. This, yeah. So enough of the rant. Um, let's get a bit more sophisticated. Let's do a comparison of the advantages and disadvantages of containers and serverless. Containers, you have control and flexibility. You can put whatever inside you want. Um, you're vendor agnostic. Um, as long as you know, use a Docker container or some other container um, uh, runtimes, Docker is today uh, the most, um, uh, most no known um, platform. Um, you can execute it wherever the Docker daemon runs. Uh, you have an easier migration path because the Docker um, container is still um, a server or a machine. And just put your application into a, a container and you can port it wherever you go. Disadvantages. Advantages. You have administrative works. We already um, covered that point. 
you have all to maintain all the layers to execute containers. Um, scaling is slower. It's not that um, currently uh, the case because Kubernetes uh, did some um, really good stuff at, at scaling the infrastructure. Um, so I should delete this point for future talks. Um, you have running costs because your infrastructure runs all the time, even if you don't need it. Uh, it's hard to get started. Remember the Tesla guys? So to get started, of course, simple installation of Kubernetes is not that hard. It's just a few lines at the, the console and then you have a running con uh, a cluster, but how to maintain it in, in, a, um, in the right way, that's the hard point. And you have a real high manual um, intervention. If you want to support uh, 24 hours, seven days a week um, infrastructure with Kubernetes, you need manpower. And um, if I, I do a calculation based on the German uh, legal restrictions, I need at least six to eight people just for maintaining a 24 seven um, system. And paying eight people a year, that's pretty much. That's just the people. You don't have any container executed at this point. In comparison of serverless, you have near to zero administration of infrastructure. It's all there. You only pay what you use, pay for execution. Therefore, you have zero cost for idle time. Of course, if you don't use it, you don't pay for it. You have auto scaling. Auto scaling to your credit card. Also did this. Um, faster time to market because you can focus on your um, on your, your um, on your business. Don't have to care about technical things. Microservice nature, of course. You have clearer code base separation. Um, yeah, you can say you have a clearer code base separation, but um, functions are much more smaller, so you need more functions, and more functions mean um, sometimes more problems. So be aware of uh, all this managing stuff. Um, reduced administration and maintenance, we are, and that's the same as the, the first thing. Um, disadvantages, yeah, no standardization yet. All the cloud providers have different structures, different standards using um, your, your functions. And that's not that fun, but um, with a bit of effort, it, you can handle it, but it's not that, not that good at the moment. I think in the future it will be, uh, get better. Um, you have a black box environment, so you can't look inside the environment which executes your, your function. Um, until uh, last week. Uh, last week there were um, reInvent keynote and um, they announced um, Lambda layers and custom runtimes. So I just read uh, the headlines. Um, as I was on a, a cruise vessel on, uh, on the sea, I didn't have the chance to, to look uh, into the, the keynotes itself. Um, Lambda layers and custom runtimes are the possibility to not only uh, deploy your own code you write, uh, but also provide um, own runtimes so you can have uh, a PHP runtime if you really want to have. So I expect there will be many, many um, um, WordPress Lambda style functions in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you can share codes between um, functions with the layers. So you can perhaps um, you could, you could, not you should, you could um, build a, a, a Lambda layer with um, Spring Framework code, with all the Spring Framework uh, libraries, and then just deploy your own um, code based on the uh, Spring Framework. So you have to deploy the, the Spring, frameworks, uh, Spring Framework libraries only once to the layer, and the layer will be used in all um, the, the um, functions you're running. Um, this m can be a good idea, uh, but this also can lead to problems because of um, um, cross dependencies or dependencies in, in uh, wrong versions, whatever. 
And also, it's not a good idea to run, to execute Spring functions in HWS Lambda. Um, I wrote about that in my book as, as an example, also running a Java EE ex, um, example in HWS Lambda. So it's possible, but it's not a good idea. All, forget about it. <laughs> Just wrote small functions. Um, when they log in, yeah, you still have this yet. And um, I think um, even with cloud events, um, the, the, the login thing will, will stay in future. So we have to cope with it. Um, there's a thing called cold starts. So that's, this is really bad, cold starts. Um, cold start is uh, when your code is um, the first time executed, the cloud provider will package it into a um, container and power the container up. So your code has to be initialized. Um, and depending on your environment and uh, the code, this can take some seconds. In case of a, a Java function, this can take some more seconds. Um, even JavaScript functions can take up to uh, two or three seconds. I already uh, saw this. If there are too many um, uh, libraries um, deployed with your function. So um, you should always uh, take care of um, the dependencies deploying with your function. So use um, less dependencies, just sometimes it's better to duplicate code to write the code um, for yourself instead of using a dependency or a library for just using um, uh, one little, little function like um, left pad. pad, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and complex apps can be hard to build and manage, as I said already, more functions, more problems, Still, there are no good tools to manage all um, the, the functions, all the resources you need to execute. This is um, still um, a bad thing. Yeah. But if you're happy with the disadvantage, uh, disadvantages, disadvantages, it's difficult for me, um, and you like all these uh, advantages for serverless, then um, you should go with serverless. And now you're asking me, we heard about the advantages and disadvantages of serverless and containers. When to choose what? Hmm. It depends, the consultant answer. <laughs> um, let's do an excursion to Kelsey Hightower. Kelsey Hightower, Google evangelist for um, Kubernetes. Is it pronounced Kubernetes or Kubernetes? I don't know. Some in Germany, some people say Kubernetes, some say Kubernetes, I don't know. Um, Kelsey Hightower is the evangelist for this tool. And uh, last year, also October last year, he said, oh, I don't see uh, any advantages of dealing with source code, loading up source code. Containers are a good thing. And I understand con uh, containers. I don't understand this other thing. And uh, in, in uh, April, in April uh, this year, he said, oh, because perhaps I have to change the way I'm thinking. Because serverless is a real good approach for all um, eventing stuff, for all asynchronous stuff. Perhaps not the best um, stuff for using um, synchronous applications, but a good way for using um, asynchronous stuff. And perhaps we have to rethink our thinking if you have a look at the, um, some use cases, we have this serverless web architecture. This is the standard web architecture, S3, serving static web content and some dynamic web content uh, via the API gateway, Lambda and perhaps DynamoDB or other um, databases. Um, actually, 80, around 80% 80 of all the deployed Lambda functions in AWS um, are synchronous web functions. <coughs> you can do this, but that's not the best way because we have this cold start, cold start up latency and there's no final solution until now for this um, thing. So I prefer um, using asynchronous stuff. You have some data, some mass data, machine learning data, IoT data, whatever, streaming data, um, perhaps with uh, Kinesis streams or some, um, some other tools 
and then process it with a Lambda and store it in some uh, database. So this is completely asynchronous, there's no user interaction uh, involved and it doesn't matter if uh, the Lambda function takes 100 milliseconds to power up or two seconds to power up. And that's only the first time. If one function is this, um, uh, warmed up once, um, you won't have the, the um, cold start up latency. But if you have the um, um, cold start up, cold start up, this won't uh, uh, won't bother you in asynchronous way. Also, I, I um, created a serverless analytics um, scenario. Uh, be, perhaps you have heard about uh, this European stuff, GDPR. Um, crazy, really crazy. Um, so some customers don't uh, want, uh, didn't want to use uh, Google Analytics anymore. So I created a small uh, solution, um, serverless analytics, a small uh, JavaScript um, um, library, sending some data to Amazon API gateway, collecting via stream, processing it via Lambda and storing it in a um, DynamoDB. So this is great, um, a great usage for, for uh, processing data. Um, that's, that's only half user interactive because it's an asynchronous um, a request from the web page. So the web page isn't uh, blocked while uh, the Lambda function uh, is powered. And also the Lambda function is, is hidden behind a, a Kinesis stream. So there will be no um, cold start up, cold start up uh, problem. And also per perhaps you have heard about TJ Holloway Chuck. That's a guy uh, creating the uh, Express framework for Node.js environments. And he also says, um, this is where Lambda shines. Fantastic for pipelines and data processing. And that's a really cool uh, tool, all the serverless stuff for processing data <coughs> and not for doing um, user interactions. I also um, advise uh, my customers to use Lambda style functions for asynchronous data and not uh, user um, interacting stuff such as um, converting documents from Word to PDF or um, just collecting data, whatever um, occurs. And um, yeah, serverless is the next step in the evolution of containers. And um, if we think further or have already a look further, um, there's a serverless re re relational database cluster, serverless Aurora. Um, Aurora itself, it's a database cluster. It's written by HWS and has an interface for MySQL and PostgreSQL. Uh, drivers, so you can use your um, uh, PostgreSQL or MySQL code uh, accessing um, Aurora database. And um, Aurora itself is a distributed cluster. So you just use it and the data is um, um, stored redundant um, via in, 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 um, in multiple availability zones and um, if you want also in, in multiple regions. Um, automatically, so you uh, don't have to care. And this uh, database cluster comes now with um, serverless architecture. So we have the database storage, um, where your data is stored, and um, the connection between your application and the storage, the um, computing uh, capacities, is um, is empty if you don't need the database. And if your application needs a connection to the uh, database storage from a um, warm pool of database capacity, a compute um, uh, engine is um, put in there. Your application is able to, um, to access the data, to read it, to um, write it, delete it, whatever. And after you access the database storage, um, the compute engine will be put back to the database capacity pool for other customers. Um, they can use it. So you don't have to pay for a running cluster 24-7. You just pay Aurora serverless um, in steps of the se in seconds. If you need it only for 
one, two or three seconds, you just pay these amount of seconds. You don't pay the whole month. That's really an interesting um, uh, approach. And uh, at the reInvent, HWS um, also said, because uh, Aurora still was um, only accessible, uh, serverless Aurora was still accessible only f uh, with MySQL, and um, HWS now announced at reInvent um, there will be also PostgreSQL interface for serverless Aurora. So that's really an um, interesting approach. Yeah, serverless. It's not a question of if. Serverless is already here. Um, HWS Lambda, as the most popular solution, is now uh, four years old. I started to use uh, Lambda three years ago. And it's really amazing what they developed in, in the, in the uh, meantime. Uh, if, you, if you still um, haven't used it, try it out. It's, it's amazing. Um, serverless is just a question of when. I think in the next two, three or four years, um, you poor guys have to deal with Kubernetes. Um, but I think in five years, nobody of the developers is talking about Kubernetes anymore. All this serverless stuff is uh, widespread and widely used in all the applications. So it's already there. Go and use it and don't think about, should I really use it? Is it really the next big thing? It's, it is. Just give it the time. And there are all, uh, also the first companies um, doing a serverless first approach. This is um, Trustpilot of uh, Denmark. If serverless is not available or practical, containers are recommended. But only if a serverless is not available or practical. Virtual servers are considered legacy and should be avoided. So no more EC2 at all, and um, use serverless where applicable. And I think uh, starting from tomorrow, all of you um, using serverless, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, perhaps. Thank you so much for listening. I really enjoyed it. And if you have questions, just ask. Thanks. Uh, the, the, slide, the slides are available at this uh, URL, if you need the slides. Are there any questions I can answer? Well, sort of a, a meta question. So you said that around 70% of, or 80%, right, of yeah. the functions deployed are basically synchronous websites or operations, yep. right? And on the other hand, it looks like you and the guys, like the creator of Express, right? TJ Holloway, Chuck. Yes. So you're sort of aligned that it's not a very good use for Lambda functions, yeah. right? What's the problem? Like, why yeah. is it happening? Uh, it's, a, it's the same problem. With, it's the same problem like uh, left pad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because there's npm, and it's so easy to publish um, a package and a library on npm, and have this uh, 15 minutes of fame for everyone. Um, all the script kids, sorry for this verse. Um, go out and publish some Lambda functions. Um, I don't know if all these 80% um, of, of all the deployed functions are actually executed. It's just a, um, a value um, HWS um, uh, announced uh, or uh, um, communicated of all the deployed um, functions, which events they're depending on. And 80% of the uh, functions deployed are depending on HTTP events. And perhaps they're never executed. It was just a test or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's, it's just a st uh, statistical yeah, issue. Probably sort of reverse my, my question, right? So I'm sort of in the process of building that, up, that kind of application. Okay. With the Lambda function serving, like, you know, backing the whatever front application doing something. Right, so am I doing something wrong? Should I go to containers? Um, that, or what are the problems? 
if 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 you have uh, the request for having um, fast response times um, 24/7, then perhaps containers could be a better fit today. Um, uh, this <coughs> company, um, Trustpilot, um, uh, which did, uh, does this serverless-first approach, um, they have pretty much engineers focusing on um, reducing all this um, cold start up latency. They're just um, investigating each function, uh, which bits they can um, eliminate to, uh, to power on. They are also um, having much um, web functions running. Um, they have, but they have uh, many people focusing all at exactly this thing of um, cold startup problems. If you have the, the, the manpower for doing all this uh, thing, then it yeah, <laughs> could be a bit um, complicated. Um, so if it's just yourself, today containers might be a better approach. But then uh, think about uh, uh, of Fargate or such uh, things, uh, or at least a, a managed Kubernetes um, environment. Because I th don't know if you want to care about Kubernetes. Well, it's probably managed, managed environment. Yes, I think so. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? Yes? Yes. And that soft limit, you cannot disable it like that. At that time, you told me this limit was set by AWS. So is that still the case? There is an initial, there's an initial level uh, number of, um, of um, simultaneous uh, possible um, executions of functions. Um, this number is at 1,000, uh, 1,000 parallel um, executions of functions in total. And um, you can expand this um, to any uh, number you want uh, by reaching the HWS support. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, if you're a new customer, the, the number will be 1,000. If you're an um, experienced customer, um, having used Lambda for several months and always paid your bill, uh, correctly, um, then HWS will expand it automatically to 3,000. Uh, but if you want to have a, a higher number, you have to call uh, support. Yes. But they will do it um, uh, without any uh, um, without any problems. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No more questions. One question. Well, I think one of the major challenges. This serverless function is uh, uh, monitoring. So, do you have like a, some good recommendation on how you can monitor the different functions and how they play together? Monitoring is one of the, the big challenges in, in, in serverless, yes. Um, there is a service called HWS X ray. And uh, it's not uh, bound to, to serverless. It's uh, possible for all uh, HWS resources. And um, X-Ray gives you a, a deep uh, look inside um, all the resources communicating with each other. And so you can also see a percentage of uh, failed and successful uh, requests to each other um, and uh, what exactly what the case uh, for a failed um, execution and all this stuff. So um, X-Ray is, is uh, one of a good uh, solution to do, do this. And um, on the other hand, it depends what you're used to, uh, uh, to, to use in, in, in the past so long. So you can, um, from every function, of course, you can um, write your own code to send uh, data to your own uh, monitoring solution. But uh, in, in HWS itself, it's uh, X-Ray. And I think they have announced a new solution at this uh, reInvent last week. But I don't know the name. I just have uh, to, to um, look up it again. But um, HWS itself, they are aware of this problem of monitoring all the functions. And they're working on it. 
they're not that good solutions already um, uh, at the, on the market. Okay? Yeah. Then, thank you so much for listening. Have a nice evening. See you. Thanks. Thanks.